have got the legend that is Oli Frost joining us very soon. So as soon as he flicks on his live, we're going to get him in. So here we go. Oh. Hello, yes. hello, hello. We did it. All right. How are you, mate? I'm good, mate. How are you doing? Very good. Now, let me just check out a minute because I'm having some haircut problems at the moment. Give me a side profile quick. I want to see what you're rocking. I'm going with a longer one today, Tim. <laughs> uh, you're wearing a headband or not? And then no headband. I just had a bit of shower, so. Uh, got, right. How about you? For our session, I've got an option for you. I can either go with the Johnny Bravo yeah. or Artful Dodger. Oh, oh. <laughs> I really feel like a 50 50. I mean, I like the Dodger. <laughs> half and half. Let's start with Johnny Bravo. Right. Oh, now, love it. Before we get into it, I've got yeah. a little bit of something. So what I thought would be useful, podcast live, I guess, they might need a little bit of like uh, some intro music, like workout music. Yeah. So I've picked you a workout track. <laughs> Do you want to hear it? Yeah. Well, I'm hoping that Instagram doesn't have a mouth over this. Right, ready? Here it comes. Let me just spin it up a little bit. Do some volume. <laughs> This is this is a new this is the track I chose for you for today. Okay. Oh, I like it, mate. I like it. Good. We're all ready to go. Lovely. Right. So. Right. Let's try this way. That better. That might be better. Yeah, that's better. Cool, guys. So we're going to reach out, get as tall as you can, trying to get something off the top shelf, and then back into the forward. So just getting some movement through the spine, and then across, um, and then up. So yeah, yeah. Get extension of your limbs at the same time, keeping your body moving, feet are parallel. Couple more, and you can start to change it up. So you can go across, up, forward, across. It's nice and easy. Another 10 seconds. Reach up and back. Reach up, and then we're going to go slow mo. So, Mr. Tai Chi now, really slow. Take yourself around, up, across. How slow can you move while still reaching extension of your limbs? And then back through, push, through the air, three, two, one. And then feet back to centre, feet parallel. Put your hands into like an imaginary glass window, and you're going to follow the glass window all the way around. Eyes through the glass window, and you're going to try and keep your biceps glued to your ears. You're going to flex the spine. Knees can be soft or straight all the way around. And then we're going to alternate directions. So we're going to really open up laterally first, working all through the lateral net of the body, and then back around. Keep changing the side. Nice and easy. We're going to do two more. Flexion of the spine first, chin tucked all the way around. Follow. The hands. We have one more change direction all the way around. Flex the spine first. And then through. 
Cool. So we're going to do a little bit of flexion and extension now. So we're going to come onto our knees and we're going to bring the rib cage forward and then we're going to bring it back. So it's a knee and spinal wave. So we're going to come onto our knees. We're going to relax our hands. So think, um, think motion versus repetition. So think you're going to bring your arms back as the chest moves forward. Then you're going to breathe out through your nose and push back into flexion. So extension, breathe in. Breathe out through your nose as you work into flexion. Try to circulate as much air in and around your ribcage as possible. Inhale. Exhale. Feel free to hum on the exhale to try and get a little bit more air through that di diaphragm around the ribcage. Three more. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Inhale. Exhale. Good, then we're just going to speed it up for five, four, three. Really wave through this bike, keeping the, keeping the head up slightly so you've got your gaze forward. Three, two, one. Good, now if we come on to our uh, uh, hands and knees, we're going to make a little square. So, just to make sure you can see my... Just going to get down a little bit. Hey, I think I want my hat on. Hats going on. <laughs> we're moving and grooving, Tim. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do a little bit of a different cat cow. So we're going to do the usual setup, but we're going to go out to the side. Excuse me, show you my bottom too much, but we're going to go out to the side. Then we're going to come up the spine first into flexion, and then down slowly the other way. So it's a wave cat cow. And then it's a back down. So you can do the usual one if you want, really, really slow. Or we can go out to the side, peel the spine up into flexion, and then articulate down slowly onto the other side. So it's adding a little bit of a different undulation through the spine as, as we move in a circle like that. So have a, have a little play. This might be one to something to practice. And um, don't worry if you don't get it the first time. But you're just trying to work the spine slowly. I'll show you from the back, so out to the side, up, then down into the opposite direction. Right, I think because it's Sunday, the wiggly bum bit, that needs to be compulsory, right? Everyone <laughs> needs to do the wiggly bum bit. Don't just go up and down, I'm going to go <laughs> some side to side. You go, you got to so you can do a usual cat cow, or you, or you can have a go at the wavy one, and you can experiment a little bit more with your spine. Um, and obviously, you know, we want to get as much fluidity through the spine for the spine resembling water in terms of its function. So how, how much flow do you have through the spine, but at the same time control. So a lot, nice thing I like to talk about is springy strength. So having this sort of like looseness, but control at, at the same time. So we're going to go onto our backs now. I'm going to give you a different exercise to do. So we're going to put our knees up in the air and you're just going to slowly just take the knees out. So just like our rotation. Nice and easy, four or so each side. Good. And then I might need to bring it down again, so I'm just changing levels to make sure everyone can see. Uh, and then from here, guys, we're gonna go into a bit of thoracic work. So you're gonna put your top knee over like this. This bottom knee is gonna be bent. The arms, the, 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 the arms gonna be here, hands on the head. And you're going to do a smooth circle all the way around and then bring it back and keep this top knee down and we're just going to roll around super slow coming back to the start so nice rotation the aim is to keep the knee down the top knee down if you can't do that you can use a pillow or a yoga block to try and feel some contact as you're in that position we're going to do one more than change. So we've got a bit of a shoulder rotation as well, so we spin around. So the other knee's down. Your arm is going to be on the bicep. You're going to do a nice slow rotation and then bring it back around. So follow the arm, keeping that top knee pinned down. 
and then bring it around. So really nice one if, if people have had sort of chronic back pain issues, um, you know, that sort of persistent underlying pain through the back. I mean, these motions are quite nice. They're quite unloaded. Uh, it's nice to add some movement through the spine. So um, most back pain is self-limiting. So it means that you have to kind of pick exercise, which is good for you. And don't get bogged down with prescription exercises. Just try and find movements which are helpful to you. So if we're going to come onto one knee now, and we're going to, we're going to take one knee out to the side. So we're going to have like an, um, an adductor stretch set up. This hand is going to be here. This opposing hand is going to go through the gap. And then I'm going to rotate around. So I'm going to go through here, stretch through the side of my body, feel the, feel the stretch of the adductor. And then I'm going to come back around. So it goes through the gap and then back. Through the gap and then back. Nice and easy. Five. Four. Come back again. Oh, that's it. Three. Two. One and change side. Good stuff, guys. One leg out, so you get a nice stretch first for the adductor, and then you're going to come through and rotate. Come through nice and easy and rotate. How are you doing, Tim? Good, mate. Thanks. Nice and easy. Couple more. Three, two, one. Brilliant. And now we're going to come onto one knee. Let's well, put us back up again. So we'll do some hip flexor work uh, and some some more rotation bits as well. So if you come onto one knee like this, we're going to make sure that the back toe is is curled, it's pressed into the ground. The hip needs to be turned as well. So posterior tilt. So imagine a bowl of water, and you want to tip the bowl of water back towards you. So you're going to feel some nice engagement already through this rear hip flexor. So if my left knee is up, or my right knee, put the opposing arm up above your, above your head. Then you're going to turn and try and get your left hand to your right foot, keeping your hip forward. So we've got a cross lateral stretch. So we're stretching through the psoas, through the front of the body, so all the anterior chain muscles. And then we've got a slight rotation as you work back and try and touch the back foot. So really nice stretch again to try and you know, offset some of the daily flexion and extension which we always usually do. So picking movements which are a little bit different is quite cool and hit sort of different fascial lines, which is great. So we're going to do a couple, full chain side, switch it over. So lean back, try and touch the foot. Keeping the back toe curled, that's really important. We need five more. Five, four, three, two, one. Nice, and if we jump on our feet, we'll do, some, we'll do a little bit of hip mobility. So we'll stand on one leg, we'll take the knee up, into flexion, and then we'll take the leg and then we'll bring it around in a nice smooth circle. So we're just going to kick around, full control, take the leg back around. Nice and easy. Work the hip through that full motion if we can. It's up to you whether you want to contract it so it's active, or you can just keep it passive if you want. So you can play around with that. Obviously, passive isn't under your voluntary control. Active would be me squeezing the hip as I bring it back around. So you've got two options there. Is it active? Is it passive? Is the joint moving to make it dynamic? So it's a pretty simple way to break it down flexibility. Not getting confused with acronyms. Good, and then we'll change side. Turn, bring the hip around. Nice, smooth, controlled circle. Knee up, kick back. I always imagine when I'm doing these movements, I'm in water. I don't want to really push water away from the body. I'm trying to be as graceful as possible. Slowing movement down. Most of our training is quite fast, or we live quite fast, so it's quite nice when we get some chance to move 
our movement practice should reflect a slightly calmer approach sometimes. And we can really be aware of our movement patterns. It says out of range earlier, right? It was still difficult for people. Yeah. There's out of range. Yeah. Can you get an echo on my, on my audio? Can you do an echo? Um, it seems okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. So people are going getting higher and sort of grinding kind of position at the top, which gets easier, right? Working through time. Starting to spend more time, you're going to hard to stay and smoothing all these points out of it. Definitely, yeah, and, and, and I think, you know, when you first experience outer ranges or end ranges, you know, the body is quite um, resistant, so it's that it's that chance to breathe through it as well, so I'm, I know you've got Patrick McCowd on later on, but you do even as well during the practice um, to try and bring the state into a calmer state, uh, and then you can really be more internally aware of movement, as opposed to if you're a beginner and it's quite hard and you're kind of yanking your hip around and your face is quite clenched and you're driving yourself into this sort of sympathetic state, then you don't really get the most out of the movement. So I think it's always better to reduce the movement first with a calmer state so your body's in control, sending the right messages back to your nervous system and then you can sort of develop that range. And there's loads of ways to develop hip mobility. It's multifactorial, but it needs to include different directions at all times. And yeah. the extension of the limbs I did at the start is vital, and that goes to the legs, the arms. And we're trying to just think about the, water, um, the body as water. And we're trying to increase the water flow throughout our body. So when water becomes stagnant, that's obviously when we, we, we have this perceived tension of tightness, sort of fascial tightness. So the way to remove that is to work and extend your limbs in as many different directions as possible. So when you have a movement session, your session should always be around extending your limbs above your head, behind your um, back, your legs out in different directions, either passively or actively. Obviously, the more strength you have and the slightly more experienced you are, you could do more active training. So, for example, you could do kicks like this if you're a beginner. But if you're quite more experienced, you could do active holds like that. So you've got the same kind of motion that is either active or passive so it's it's your um your own ability to work around that really so cool. both are cool both have got good ways of teaching the body to move and also respect the active and passive ranges as well nice these are got echo. just hang on No idea of why audio is echoing. Oh, okay. um, well, I'll just keep talking anyway. Um, I'll, 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 I'll answer some of these questions. So, what I think a big one was we had uh, ankle dorsiflexion, wasn't it? Yeah. So if we, it, I, I can just talk to him if you if you don't want to wreck it too much. So we go if we look at the ankle and the squat. You know, I mean, there's so, there's. There's a lot of factors which can, you know, play a part in the squat and the pistol and, you know, all these core cool movements. So the first thing I'll look at with someone is their ability to flex around. So if I get everyone would come into this position like this, and then, oh, I just need to. So if you would come into a kneeling position, your back foot would be like this, and you would be sat down slightly. And when you do ankle work, always make sure that your big toe has some space between your next toe. So um, a lot of us over the years have got quite poor foot control, so it's really important to spread the feet. And then in this position, I would try and load the knee as far as I can over the toe. You can add external weight if you want. So in flexibility, this would be a static position. And then to make it active, I would try and actively uh, contract the tissue around the ankle. So this is a passive movement when there's not really much load and it's, it's, it's kind of dynamic passive. This would be static and active. So if it's static and active, I'm trying to really think about the ankle and I'm trying to do isometric work here. And the way I do that is I'll do sets of eight seconds. So I'll try and imagine the knee going down into the ground like this. So if you go over a little bit more, Tim, so your, your chest a little bit more, Keep the heel of the, of the foot down, and now we're going to isometrically contract the tissue around the ankle and try and imagine pushing the foot down. So here we go. Now we're going to squeeze for eight seconds. One, two, three, four, 
five, six, seven, eight. And then I would just push a little bit further if I could, trying to get my knee over the toe. And we're just going to do one more set today. When you're on your own, I would advise you to do these isometrics five to eight sets. We're going to do one more set though today. Yeah. So we're going to push over, knee over the toe. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then a little relaxed push over again. So you can just keep repeating that. And that's just a really nice way of driving some isometric load into the ankles to increase your ankle dorsiflexion. Um, and then we'll just change side. So spread the toes, make sure your big toes forward. We'll lean over first. So get into your maximal flexion position here. Then you're gonna, it's crucial that the heel of the foot is down into, in into the ground. Now we're gonna load. So we're gonna start to push down into the floor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then just rock. And just keep on looking at your feet. Try and get your feet as spread as possible. So we're almost visualizing a tripod. So we've got that first big toe forward. We've got the little pinky toe spread out and we've got the heel at the back glued to the ground. We're gonna do one more set, go for it now. I'm gonna push the knee over. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then just small pulses again. So that would be one key exercise I, I would do. Um, and I'm just show everyone this as well, because a lot of the times the calves can get really tight and also the Achilles. So just for a bit of soft release work, I'll just do this for like 30 seconds. If you grab a broomstick and you put it in the back of the knees and you push down, you can just apply some pressure here, do like eight to 10 seconds and just work down the calf really, really slowly. So sometimes the calf and the Achilles can get super tight. So it's a really nice way just to alleviate some like restriction quite quickly if you're going into some sort of single leg work and squat pattern work as well. So I won't show you much more of this, but it's just your ability to push down. And then from there, I would work some toe extension. So obviously our, our body's ability to work, this thing here is pretty important. And this is how we distribute load for our body. So if this big toe hasn't got the right connection when I load, it's not gonna send sensory feedback to our brains that we're in a safe place to move or load our body or centrate our joints. So when we're like this, I would just sit in um, this position. So I would stretch the toes like this. And then to make it a little bit harder, I would go from here and push forward. So nice and easy. And I would stretch the tissue through the front of the foot or through into the big toe. So it's getting some contact with the big toes as much as possible, pushing forward and back. So we'll we, we, we just do five together now. Four. Three. Two. One. And then I would get every, well, I'd get a lot of my clients to do this really simply to see if, to see if they had control over their big toe. Is I would say, put, put your feet flat on the ground and can you lift up your big toe? Maybe jumped off there. And um, we'll we'll be we'll good, yeah. So if if you can't lift up this big toe, without like these toes lifting up, like you can see my big toe on this side is very different to this side. And I haven't got very good toe extension and this is a lot of my injuries have actually been on my left side. So whether that correlates, I don't actually know for sure. I know that my body doesn't load this side of the body that well. So it's crucial that you work your feet, you work your intrinsic muscles, and you work your big toe, because your big toe needs to be able to move freely through flexion and extension as you load and you possibly stand on the ground. So as we kind of move up the chain, I'm not going to do tibial rotation. It's quite hard for people to understand too much on this one. I'll just go straight into the hip. So when I'm looking at hip, I'll look at someone's internal rotation. So if you lie like this, and then you're going to see how far you can drop the foot out and then change. If you're someone who's quite stiff and you can't really move the hip very well into internal rotation, just put your knees a bit closer together, Tim, and put your hands out to the side. Just put your hands out, that's it. And slowly put, take, take the leg out, that's it. And then just change side. 
And you're just trying to see if there's a, you know, a slight mismatch between um, the, 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 the hip itself. So people who suffer from poor internal rotation will then have um, problems further and, and up and down the chain. I've heard about the big toes at the knuckles. So, so uh, also, ideally, you can do isometrics with the big toe as well. You can pull the big toe down and you can straighten the big toe slowly. So you can load the big toe in isolation as well. Just going to give you a couple of ideas today. Uh, ways to improve hip internal rotation, quite simply, if you were struggling with that exercise, again, is to do general joint rotation, so either passive or active like we did at the start almost. Uh, in more isolation, you can lie on the side, you can put the block between your knees like this, and you can slowly take this top leg into internal rotation like this. And then here, depending on how you feel this, if you feel it's quite pinchy, then I would just sort of set it like that. If it's okay, I would add some isometric load, thereby I would be thinking about actively squeezing this hip flexor and trying to rotate my femur towards my midline, and I would try and contract here like that. So that's quite a simple way to work internal rotation in, in, in isolation. Um, and then obviously I would change side. And, I, and I'll just go through a bit more of a, um, just some more rotation again for the joint. So if you sit in 90-90 like this, and then we'll just do a nice sort of movement pattern around this. So if we sit in 90-90, you'll come around with the back foot, and then you'll take it back slowly. So again, it's like a, a single-sided joint rotation. Again, if you struggle to do it actively, you can do it a little bit faster. Ideally, to, to understand your body's awareness and control, the movement would be active, whereby you're contracting the tissue on the either side of the joint. So again, this is completely personal to you at the moment. I would, I would recommend that you work into these active ranges. Okay, we'll do five more. Four, three, two, one. Brilliant, and we'll change side. So there's lots of cool components to break down with the squat and with single leg work. Um, and they all obviously have a big influence on one another. So it's, it's one of these things where, you know, don't be disheartened if one area isn't so good at the moment. Your body will adapt. Give it the right stimulus, stay patient. Um, and things will change at their natural rate. If you've worn heel or shoes all your life, then you know, you've got to expect that things will, will take a little bit longer to change um, or you haven't been wearing maybe the right footwear. Um, you know, you've got different arches in your feet, you've got structural sort of variations. So there's lots of things which play a part and contribute to people's squat patterns. So um, don't be too disheartened. Ollie, into this. Yeah. A couple of questions around that. Um, like hip mobility of the pancakes and press the hand. Yeah. Can we go through uh, that? that? Yeah, of course. So when I'm training um, the middle split now and the pancake, um, I wouldn't train it like this. So I wouldn't train it as much anymore going into this position because it derives too much around trunk flexion. And also we don't really activate and, and re re recruit the strength we need to go into that mid middle split position because of the trunks are heavily involved. So if we go into a middle split now, like this, just get my camera back a bit more so you can see. Me. Um, sorry, a bit DIY camera. All right, so if we go into this middle split now, here, so this is a much better way to kind of train the adductors uh, in this position. So what we'll do is, We'll try and isometrically squeeze the hips together. So we'll try and feel the line and stretch from the adductor all the way down to the foot. And again, when you're on your own, sort of five to eight sets, eight second contraction, and then a slight relax in between. So we'll do the contraction now. So we'll start to squeeze the hips together for eight seconds. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. On the relax, go a little bit lower if you can. And then we'll keep all the toes in play. And then we're gonna squeeze the hips together again. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then you can go a little bit lower again. We'll do two more sets. So 
So we're going to squeeze one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and relax. So this is a really good stretch and it's isometric, so we're going to actively recruit a lot of the tissue around the hip joint properly. Um, and also it, it removes trunk flexion. So we're, we're going to go for one more. We're going to squeeze the hips together now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then slowly just walk yourself back to the top because um, if you haven't been in that position for a while, you'll probably feel it when you come back up. So that, that would be nice. the most simple and the most effective way to train the adductors and all that hip control and stability to go into things like press the handstand. I wouldn't do, especially if you're a guy and you've got quite a stiff rib cage like myself and the ribs are locked and you've done lots of weight training and going into this forward fold position, you're going to kind of beat yourself up with doing because you're not going to feel it so much in the hip. It's all going to be coming from the trunk. So we can completely remove that and we can isolate the adductors which is what we want to strengthen the most, and the gracilis properly when we're in that middle split position, like that. Um, it would help, yeah. I think it would help. I think I think you would have a much better crossover um, to going into those sort of moves. Um, personally, I found it very, um, very good to do the training like that, and I have a better maintenance track record holding my middle split from doing the exercise alone. Very simple. Yeah. And there's also one for the, for the front split and it just helps get into those really good ranges quite quickly. Um, nice. Are you still getting pressed on my body? I think it's going to be like, screwed it up. It seems all right at my end, but I don't... Cool. Let's see. I'll look one of them. Uh, let's see some more questions that we've got. Anything about hamstrings on like, because people sometimes struggle with the handstand with like, hamstring position. Okay. Being able to get it a bit up, you know, get low enough. Yeah. So <clears throat> when nice Tim. <laughs> so then um, look at that, straight up. So when you do um, um when you do hamstring work, uh, again, same kind of premise as the middle split one, you want the hips to be square and you and you want the you want, what's the point of the stretch and where do you want to feel it and how is the most effective way to stretch? And this is one way I would do the hip. I would always do the hamstring. You can do this on an elevated surface, but you put your leg like this out, out in front and instead of having the leg completely straight, you flex the knee. When you flex the knee and you take your hip into an anterior position, so imagine you're going to like an RDL, then Tim, if you bring your toes up towards you, so you're trying to actively pull the toes up now. And now we're going to really try and feel it in the belly of the hamstring. So where the hamstring properly inserts and is in the issue of tuberosity in the back of the gluteus. So when, when we're here, we're going to pull the toes up. And now we're going to do isometric work again. So we're going to keep our chest up, our spine neutral. And you're going to start to actively pull down into the ground <clears throat> with the front foot. So when you've got that position now, you should feel your hamstring. So we do five, four, three two, one, and then you can go into some pulses. One, two, three, four, five. Really slow, just keep your head up, Tim. Keep on looking forward, like big chest, be really proud. It's just like the same deadlift technique, keeping the toes always pulled up towards you. But now we're gonna do the second set. You're gonna try and pull down harder again into the floor. You can do this on a chair. It's really good off a chair or an elevated surface. Pull down now, five, four, Three, two, one, and pulse. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, good. We'll train side just so I just want to get through some more stuff. But I would do four to five to eight sets on that, and you can do it really well off an elevated surface. So if 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 we're standing, have this leg on a chair or a stool, and it just changes the angle of the hip again. So. Pull, pull up the toes, hinge over, like imagine you're going into an RDL or a deadlift. Now we're going to pull down into the floor quite hard, okay? So we're going to really tighten through the hamstring properly. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then we're going to hinge forward. One, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I'm going to go down again, pull down a little bit harder for the second set. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And a hinge, nice and slow. And if you didn't feel it much in your hamstring at the moment, it's because your legs are either too straight or your spine is flexed. So it's really important that your spine stays extended slightly and the hip is in an anterior pelvic shape. So it's not um, posteriorly tilted and the spine is in inflection. Um, and when you get those things right, you will properly stretch your hamstrings. Ollie, what is the idea of pulsing? So pulsing is a ballistic type of stretching which goes past your stretch reflex. I think it's personal to you and it's also, it's not something I would do with everyone. So I think control pulsing is fine. I think you see high level martial arts and gymnasts, they'll do quite fast, aggressive pulsing because they built up a very high prerequisite of flexibility from a, from a very young age, from doing various activity. I think it's not relevant. I think isometric stretching is, is, is the most effective way to stretch. So, so when you, so when you when you actively um, contract the tissue either side of the joint. And obviously there's a thousand acronyms at the moment, PALES, RAILS, contract, relax, PNF, they're all the same. It's contract the tissue either side of the joint. Don't get confused. Just keep it simple. Contract the agonist or the, or the antagonist. Eight seconds to 10 second contraction, five sets and then change. So don't get confused with all the acronyms on, on the internet and all the courses. Just keep it simple. Is the joint moving? Is it not moving? Is it active or is it passive? And give your body as much di as much different information in as you can around stretching, and your body will you know have all the nutrients in terms of the variability it needs. Keep us my you have to talk, Ollie. Okay, all right, I can just keep talking. You sound like you're in water. <laughs> all right. Uh, Tim, <laughs> so, um, Tim, Tim didn't really say anything. Tim, what is funny? It's all right. Um, can you just keep asking me questions, guys? If not, I can just keep going through it. I think there was one for shoulders. Uh, I think there's um, building the muscles on the outside of the knee to stabilize. So to, to stabilize the knee for single leg squats, you can do eccentric movements. So um, if you're doing stuff like this, if you have like a block, you can just stand on one block and you can slowly. So, or a, or a step, and you would basically just step down slowly like, like that. So it's nice and simple. It's eccentric and it's single leg. Uh, start with a low surface, and that's a really good way to improve the stability around the knee. Uh, and then obviously I would focus on just, ham just, just some hamstring work as well and some lateral movement. So when you're going either side um, with control, so that's. Uh, we're gonna take one more. I think. Yeah. Oh, I don't think I'm echoing. Am I echoing still or not? I mean, I, I, I mean, you're seeing your fight. How how can you reduce shoulder pain? Information from handstand kick up reverse calls. So if you're getting shoulder pain in that position, it could be lots of things. You know, not saying it's impingement, but it, it could have those related symptoms. I would address the shoulder blade. So look at the serratus, which is the muscle underneath the shoulder blade here. And also look at, the, um, look at how well your shoulder blades move, unloaded and loaded. So doing things like scapula um, press-ups and just single arm holds isometrically and trying to feel the muscle beneath here engage. So if you do this press-up position like this, and you put your hand like this and you try and do this movement here, which is a scapula push up and you don't see all this muscle engaged properly at all then that could potentially um show that you're you're, you're not quite connecting the serratus to the scapula properly which means when your arm goes over your head you're going to get pain-like symptoms from the fact that you haven't got as much stability through the shoulder blade when it sticks to the rib cage when your arm goes over your head so i would also don't go into full vertical handstands do handstands more on a slant versus fully vertical for a while and then slowly creep back up again because you don't load in the shoulder if you're getting pain. Um, pain is usually the end result of something which isn't functioning 
functionally working properly. So I would always look at the shoulder blade, doing some just some isolated shoulder blade movements, and then some some serratus work and trying to build all that together. Do you know the one I think I've been using yours only recently? This one of this week. I think this is where I've got this from you. Going through like standing, but here all the way around, and then behind. Is that on yours? Yeah, well, it, well, it's just a shoulder articulation. I like that one. For, 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 for the shoulders, again, you know, the thing is you can get creative with the shoulder. The shoulder is the most mobile joint in the body. So you can do these movements passive. You can do them with speed. You can do them with control. So, again, you know, like we can move the shoulders as many different ways as we want with as much control or as little control. It depends on the purpose of the exercise. But I would recommend, like I mentioned earlier, is to have a healthy blend between the both. TFL. Nice. Yeah, TFL's a tricky one. If you've got anything for TFL specifically, it's a hard one to get at, I think. You've got to get that lean on, haven't you? It's a bit like you've actually kind of did that one. It's a bit, you get a bit TFL in here, right? If we're going to go into this one. Yeah, a bit of TFL there. Yeah, I mean, um, I, w I wouldn't look at, I wouldn't think about the body in like a, in a reductionist way. I wouldn't think like there's an area of weakness. I would try and strengthen all the tissue around it versus isolating mentally areas of the body because everything's blended through fascia anyway. So if I would work movements like we did, like this, or like things like the windmill, things like that, or yeah, you can put some soft tissue work in it, but more rotational movements when you're working around different areas um, would be much more beneficial because you're going to add more movement to the area. And then if you want to try and load that area, I would do things like hip going out and then you can just do some, like some fire hydrant stuff just to try and add some more stability. And obviously you can do a joint rotation as well. So movement first, passive and active, and then more isolated work to superset that with. So, um, <laughs> Trying to think of that sort of like movement, not muscles, isn't it? Rather than isolating, we want to try and string it together into a better yeah. sequence. Looking at the body as, you know, sort of kinetic chains versus yeah. independent m muscle groups. Um, because obviously everything works together. Right. That's been amazing. I'm going to wrap it up because Jacko's coming okay. on in 15 minutes. So um, just to say, and I think there's so much good stuff for people to go and watch back. And, and just to, to reiterate the point of this sort of stuff, it's like, Doing it like once a week or once every other week, you're not going to get that much progress, right? It needs to be something which we're doing on almost a daily basis, moving through patterns, and then people are going to start to see some real progression. So they, if they go back through this video, there's like weeks worth of stuff just but to do these same things on a repetitive basis. 100%. And it's, it's creating habitual patterns and it's, you know, it's your own perception and you're, you're trying to create empowerment for yourself. And it's, it's, it's your taking onus of your own body and how you want to move for the rest of your life. And it has to be on a daily basis and it has to be something you enjoy doing. So find stuff you enjoy doing first. Don't do stuff, stuff you don't like doing so it won't last very long. And just, just let your body go, let your mind go and just try and really immerse yourself into being the best human and you, know, you can be through the power of movement. Amazing. So if anyone wants any more information, guys, you can obviously can follow Ollie and you can check out all of his stuff. Um, he does sessions in London, workshops, clinics, all that sort of stuff. So go and see about everything that he's got going on. And you can also, we did a, a collaboration with Ollie on our virtual classroom, our Mover and Mobility Masterclass. You can find that on our website. There's a load of stuff in there, which is so good. Lots of things we covered today, plus some others. Go and check that out as well. And um, yeah, I think this is always something whenever I spend time with Ollie, I'm like, I need to do more of this stuff because I get distracted by the strength work and I'm like, I just want to go and do strength work. But I know that like, I've done a lot of strength work recently and that's where I've gone back to my shoulders are starting to grind down a bit. And I'm like, okay, I've got to go back and I've missed the piece of the puzzle now because I'm not moving them enough. They're getting stronger, but I'm losing mobility. So I've got to go and balance that out. So it's always a good reminder. Loved it. Thanks, guys. All right. Mate, thank you so much. You're going to get me. <laughs> Go on, I got it, I got it. Take care, mate. Thanks so much. Cheers, guys. See you guys. Bye bye. Take care. All right, guys, that's the end of the session with Ollie. Just another big thank you to Red Light Rising for sponsoring the podcast live. And we're going to sign this one off. And uh, Jacko is up with Richard Norton next at 11. These are all going to be available to replay on IGTV from pretty much now when I post it. So enjoy the rest of the day, guys. We hopefully see you along. And Ollie will catch up soon. Bye bye. Take care. <laughs>